meeting is being recorded. Hello, hello, welcome everyone to session four of the Massive Open Online course for the University of Nicosia's uh, master's degree in digital currencies. I'm Andreas M. Antonopoulos, and I'll be answering your questions from the past week. We've got lots of interesting questions, and uh, good to see you in the chat. A quick bit of uh, logistics, as usual, I will prioritize the questions that you and your fellow students asked during the week um, and uh, asked in the uh, forums. And if you have any follow-up or you need any clarification on the basis of something that I'm talking about at that particular moment, uh, please pop up in the chat, say follow-up or clarification, and I'll take a look. Please don't ask new questions in the chat um, because we probably won't have time to answer them. Um, and so let's get started. Our first question comes from Chia Kwan, asks, Hi Andres, would there still be a way for on-chain sleuths, uh, sleuth meaning a detective or investigator, to know and piece to various addresses created by a hierarchical deterministic or HD wallet together and link them to a single owner? If so, would you be able to elaborate how such a scenario can arise? Would that be when you make a payment linking a few inputs and addresses in that transaction. So um, let's first define some terms and go over some of the basics. First of all, uh, an HD wallet, uh, I think the best way to imagine an HD wallet um, is a tree. And that's because that's the structure, the algorithmic structure uh, or the data structure that is used for HD wallets. So HD wallets produce a tree of keys. Um, so imagine my hand is a tree and each one of these branches is uh, a different set of keys. And um, the way we use an HD wallet is we have a seed, which is the 12 to 24 English words based on the BIP39 standard. And we use that seed um, to grow a tree. So each seed grows a tree. Uh, the tree has different branches. Maybe one branch is for Bitcoin, one branch is for Ethereum, one branch is for something else, whatever. Uh, and you can specify um, that each branch is used for different cryptocurrencies. And then each one of the branches may have further branches that correspond to things like in Bitcoin receive and change addresses um, or uh, corresponds to sub accounts or various other organizing structure that you want to have in your wallet. Eventually you get down to the individual keys and you can think of the keys like the leaves that grow on this tree. So the question is, can you relate these different keys or the addresses produced from these keys to each other by looking on the blockchain. Um, one of the practices we have in Bitcoin is to use a new address for every transaction. And if you have a wallet that has been initialized with a seed, um, what you'll see is at first you'll see one Bitcoin address. You'll do a transaction, let's say you receive some money, Next time you open your wallet and ask for an address, it's going to give you a different one. And that might be confusing at first. Eff effectively, what it's doing is it's not reusing the addresses. It's making sure it doesn't reuse the address. So it will produce a new address for you, and it can do so on demand. And each address you can think of is a leaf uh, hanging off the branch. Uh, so there's um, address 0, address 1, address 2, address 3, etc., hanging off. Uh, the Bitcoin branch of the tree. So what's the relationship between address zero and address one? Um, they're produced from two different private keys and those private keys are generated through a hash function. And what that does is it makes it impossible to link the addresses together. So the output of a hash function will appear random uh, and this is one of the properties of hash functions. So we use that in uh, HD wallets 
so that the addresses, uh, even though they're sequentially generated, address zero, address one, address two, et cetera, they appear to be random. Uh, you can't see any features on the addresses that would allow you to link them together in any way or predict what the next one will be or what the previous one is, et cetera, unless you actually have access to uh, the private keys or um, an extended public key, which are different segments of the tree that allow you to generate more addresses. So the addresses themselves appear random, but they're not actually random. They're generated in a deterministic way from a seed, a deterministic meaning that you can always predict the, the next address if you have the keys. And th this is why it's called a hierarchical deterministic wallet. Hierarchical because it has a structure and that structure is a tree. Deterministic um, because the keys are not random or the addresses are not random. Uh, they're determined in advance from the seed. Now, your wallet can generate up to 2 billion of these uh, addresses uh, or keys uh, off a single branch of the tree. And you can always create another sub-account and get another 2 billion addresses, another sub-account and get another 2 billion addresses. And you could create 2 billion sub-accounts, uh, each of which has 2 billion addresses. So you're not running out of addresses anytime soon. Not a problem. Um, so to the question of Xiquan, can someone, by observing the blockchain, uh, connect two of these addresses and realize that they belong to the same wallet or to the same owner? Not per se, not based on the addresses themselves. However, they can based on patterns that you create through the use of your wallet. And this is by linking inputs together. So uh, for example, um, if you receive two small amounts on two um, consecutive addresses from two different sources, uh, and then you want to make a payment um, that is bigger than either of those two amounts. And so in order to make that payment, your wallet has to create a transaction that consumes both of those uh, smaller payments uh, and adds them together to make a bigger payment uh, that you want to make. Then uh, both of those are going to appear as inputs to the same transaction. And given that that transaction will look like uh, the transaction made by a single pair wallet, um, someone can therefore assume to a certain degree of probability that those two addresses belong to the same owner. So they can do that correlation. So what's correlating the addresses is not the fact that there is any pattern in the addresses that can be discerned, but rather the fact that the two addresses appear together within a single transaction. The transaction correlates the address by mixing them together. Some wallets are better at doing privacy than others, and they will avoid correlating inputs as much as possible. Um, and uh, so some of those wallets are better at doing it. Some wallets are worse at doing it. And different cryptocurrencies are better or worse at doing this. For example, in Ethereum, because you don't have the UTXO structure, you have an account-based um, structure. It is actually quite cumbersome to um, use more than one address. So in Ethereum, we tend to see address reuse. The same address is used again and again and again and again because you cannot combine two addresses in a single transaction. So you either have the money in one address or you don't. Um, and if you don't, you'd have to move money around doing transactions in order to, uh, to do that. So you would effectively correlate them anyway. Uh, so Ethereum uh, doesn't allow you to use a separate really address per each transaction, not in a convenient way. And you'll see a lot less privacy there. Uh, other privacy mechanisms would be used there.
Christine asks, we know that transactions cannot be reversed, and if someone hacks into an exchange, your wallet or the provider holding your keys stops operating, you lose everything you have without an option of recovering it in any way. With a bank, you can at least file a dispute and recover your lost funds. Why are exchanges and digital wallets like MetaMask, WallConnect, et cetera, exempt from protecting their customers if they are responsible for the funds you hold in that account? So exchanges are not really exempt from protecting their customers. It's just that the rules under which exchanges operate are often different from the rules that a bank operates under because they're not in the same regulatory domain. So they're regulated differently. And every country has its own rules and regulations which will apply differently to exchanges. Um, and exchanges are not very well regulated. In many countries, there is very limited regulation as to the security of exchanges, which is why you can have um, operators constructing exchanges with very few safeguards, as we saw in the case of FTX, but as we've seen in the case of dozens of previous failed exchanges and wallets. Um, when you're comparing cryptocurrency to banks, you have to understand that uh, one of the reasons they're not regulated in the same way is because they're not meant to be used in the same way. And that's because uh, in order to properly use, at least in my opinion, a cryptocurrency, you should be taking control of the funds and owning uh, the keys and controlling the keys. And if you use them in that way, then um, you are responsible ultimately for your own security. The Basically, the exchange or wallet is not a good source for security um, because this is digital money. And unlike a bank, um, if the money is stolen from an exchange, it's uh, almost impossible to get back even for the exchange themselves, because a transaction is not reversible. There's another kind of underlying question here, which is why not just make cryptocurrency transactions reversible so that then we don't have the problem so that um, money can be taken away from thieves. And the, the real answer to that is because uh, this is by design. And it's by design because cryptocurrencies are meant to offer a different way of managing money. You see, if you make transactions reversible, then the question becomes who has the power to reverse a transaction? And the secondary question becomes on what basis are they allowed to reverse a transaction? Um, and of course, the problem is that once someone has the power to reverse a transaction, that means they can also reverse a transaction that you want to make um, as the owner of these funds, um, but for whatever reason, they don't want you to make. And that breaks one of the main concepts behind cryptocurrencies, which is that uh, you have control and they're not censorable, that you can't do censorship of the transactions. So really completely different design uh, modalities. Um, as Jiquan notice notes in the um, in the uh, comment in the chat, uh, transactions can be reversed based on social consensus. Yes, maybe in in some cryptocurrencies and with overwhelming social consensus. Um, in some cryptocurrencies, uh, e even um, with overwhelming social consensus it's too expensive to reverse a transaction. So in, in cryptocurrencies that operate based on proof of stake, you could reverse a crypto uh, a transaction fairly easily without any additional cost, simply by everyone agreeing that that transaction needs to be reversed. Um, but of course, in a proof of work system, even if 100% of the participants agree, you would still need to expend the energy to remine all of the blocks since that transaction happened. Um, there, there is no free way to do that. 
So it is expensive to rewrite history, even when you have 100% agreement. And that's why proof of work is considered a much stronger platform for immutability. All right. Um, so transactions can be reversed if they're designed in a permissioned consortium blockchain, not uh, Bitcoin. Um, and uh, as Wendy points out in the chat, uh, of course, then the, the, the question becomes, what would be the purpose of such a permission consortium blockchain other than simply replicating the banking system as it exists today? Uh, to me and to many of the people who are interested in cryptocurrency, we're interested in cryptocurrency because it does things differently than the existing banking system. The existing banking system is a system of authority and hierarchy, meaning that um, you have a hierarchy of authority where um, people higher up in that authority system can override the people lower down in that authority system and um, in that hierarchy system. And um, that is the antithesis of a decentralized, permissionless, and in my opinion, at least more democratic system of money uh, where no one can override uh, anyone else. Um, and each person who controls their keys also has uh, complete control over their own money. So uh, again, if that's not right for you, then you don't use it. Uh, but um, making another system that replicates the banking system seems kind of pointless to me, at least. Um, Callistus asks, a hardware wallet is electronic in nature. I believe it's like a flash drive. What happens when it gets spoiled or lost? How does one recover it? Uh, this is a very common question and a great question from Callistus. And the bottom line is that the device itself doesn't matter. Um, it is like a flash drive in that it has memory uh, in it, but not like a flash drive in every other way. A hardware wallet is not a device just for storing keys, but also for signing keys and signing, uh, signing with those keys and signing transactions within a secure environment um, that cannot be easily compromised. So a hardware wallet is not just a key holding device, it's also a signing device for signing transactions. In fact, the signing is the main point. Um, so the, the keys, however, that are on a hardware wallet um, are generated in such a way that you have a recovery phrase or seed. And ultimately the seed is all you need. Any wallet from any manufacturer that uses the same standard, which is 99.9% .9 of all wallets out there, will be able to take those 12 to 24 English words and recreate your entire wallet. So the hardware itself is, um, is something that's replaceable. If it gets spoiled or damaged, as long as you have your recovery phrase, you don't need the hardware wallet. You can just um, install that recovery phrase on a different hardware wallet and you've got all of your transactions, all of your history, all of your funds, all of your keys back and you can use them again. Uh, this is a, a bit difficult to realize at first that the device is just a container. Um, it's a secure container within which um, keys can be held securely and they can be used to sign transactions securely. But the container itself is, is not um, important as long as you have the thing that's inside the container, which is your seed. So um, the seed itself is uh, basically the, uh, the keys that allow you to control cryptocurrencies. Those 12 to 24 English words produce, actually produce your keys. And you could do that without a hardware device. You could do it with a piece of software. You can write uh, a script um, using any programming language. Um, I could write a, a little program that takes the 12 words and produces the keys and addresses and allows me to sign transactions. I could write that uh, knowing the specification 
in any programming language. In fact, the keys don't need to live on a hardware wallet. The hardware wallet doesn't need to be plugged in for you to receive cryptocurrency. It doesn't need to be, uh, the seed doesn't even need to be installed on a hardware wallet. So when people say things like cold storage, many times they mean um, a seed that's installed on a hardware wallet or generated and kept on a hardware wallet. Um, but I would take it one step further because you can simply produce a seed using a hardware wallet, uh, record it on something durable such as steel, and then store just the seed, wipe the hardware wallet or destroy the hardware wallet, and now your cold storage is just those 12 words. If before you generate, if before you, um, sorry, destroy the hardware wallet, you also generate an address, um, you could then give out that address or several addresses um, so that you can receive cryptocurrency or you can um, withdraw cryptocurrency. Uh, and even though those addresses don't exist anywhere other than a seed inscribed on steel, uh, you'll still be able to receive cryptocurrency to those addresses because all the receiving cryptocurrency means is an entry is made on the blockchain that says you are the rightful owner of that. And then you can resurrect the keys anytime by planting that seed on a new device. Um, and uh, then you can sign with the corresponding keys and move the money that has been recorded on the blockchain for you. So you've got to think of the money isn't in the hardware wallet, the money is on the blockchain. The keys can be in the hardware wallet, but they can also simply be uh, stored long-term as 12 to 24 English words uh, recorded in any way you like. Um, I personally advise people to keep things simple, uh, not try to overcomplicate. People come up with all of these weird schemes like, uh, let me change up the letters or we'll mix up the words or whatever. But in fact, that's very dangerous. Uh, the best and um, uh, easiest way to store a seed is to record two copies of it on steel, uh, store those two in two different places that are secured, physically secured, um, and you're done. Uh, and uh, then you can either buy a new hardware wallet anytime you want, or you can use the old hardware wallet. You can install one seed on it. You can then install another seed on it. You can reinstall the first seed on it. You can do all kinds of things like that. Um, Daniel has a follow-up question. Is it possible to destroy the receiving address itself? No, um, the receiving address isn't on the blockchain. In fact, it doesn't need to be registered with the blockchain at all. The receiving address is just a number. And so you can't destroy uh, a number. Um, you can generate it again from the key anytime you like. And all that someone's doing when they're saying send to this address is they're recording on the blockchain, hey, this Bitcoin now belongs to anyone who can produce a key that matches this number, uh, which you can produce anytime from your seed. Uh, so if that makes you the owner. But the blockchain doesn't need to know about that number in advance. Um, just like uh, if you want to send a letter in the mail, um, the recipient's address doesn't need to be known to the post office at the moment you send it. It only needs to be um, known at the moment it's delivered. Uh, in, in the case of the blockchain, it's just recorded against that address and stored on the blockchain. And if you try to sign for it, then um, the blockchain will check that your signature matches that number. Uh, so you can't destroy an address and you can't stop from someone from sending you uh, money to an address. Iris asks, uh, today most Bitcoin wallets no longer generate cryptic private keys by default. Instead, they offer a more user-friendly approach by translating the private key into a set of seed words. Um, so that's not entirely correct. Um, they're still generating private keys uh, of the same form that you saw before, 
But instead of generating one at a time, um, they can generate a sequence of them in the structure of a, of a tree. And they don't translate the private key into the seed words. It's actually the other way around. The seed words are used to then produce a series of private keys. Um, but yes, the, the part that you get to keep isn't a weird alphanumeric password-like mysterious uh, thing. Instead, it's English words. In week four presentation, it said that web wallets are not recommended. I've heard arguments suggesting that web wallets, which offer a private key, may be more secure than those using seed phrases. Uh, could you provide further insight on this topic? Um, so whoever is making this argument is wrong, uh, <laughs> to put it uh, simply. Mm, uh, first of all, seed words generate private keys of the exact same type as those used in web wallets uh, or those used anywhere, because all private keys are, are 256-bit numbers. That's it. It's just a number. It's If you wrote it in decimal, it would be a number that has 77 digits. That's what a private key is. It's just a number. It doesn't matter how you write it down. Um, you could write it with um, a decimal. You could write it in an alphanumeric script. Um, and seed words just generate a whole sequence of these numbers um, for you. But ultimately, what is used to unlock transactions on the blockchain is always this 77-digit decimal number or 256-bit binary number um, that is a private key that is used to create a signature, a public key, an address, and all of the other things. So there's no difference in security because there's no difference in keys. Um, the keys and... Um, uh, of one or the same. Uh, so web wallets are actually far, far, far less secure than every other form of uh, wallet. Um, first of all, seeds are a superior way of protecting yourself against loss because they're easy to back up and record, transcribe and recover without making mistakes. So already, because the risk of loss, because of a mistake you make, is a much greater risk than the risk of theft, and certainly much greater risk than the risk of someone cracking your key. Um, in fact, seed words are a very, very secure mechanism um, for... Um, backing up keys and storing keys from your end because it makes sure you don't lose them by accident, which is the number one reason people lose keys. Now, in terms of the security of the different devices, really the concern for from a security uh, person's perspective is whether it's connected to the internet or not. Um, and so, and 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 how it's connected to the internet and how easy it is to attack the platform that it is uh, connected to the internet. So the more specialized a platform is uh, and the more narrowly focused it is, the smaller exposure or uh, attack surface, as we call it in security, it has. So a hardware wallet, uh, which is a, a little USB uh, device, which is designed to do one thing, well, well maybe three things, uh, generate keys, store keys, and sign transactions, but they're all really the same thing. It's, generate, it's designed to do just that thing, uh, cryptographic uh, secure transactions. Um, it's not designed to do anything else, and therefore it speaks only a, a very narrow protocol that it uses to communicate with the rest of the world over the USB interface uh, or the Bluetooth interface if it's a Bluetooth device. And so it's very difficult to attack it because it only knows, let's say, a dozen different words uh, to do uh, you know, the three basic things that it needs to do. Um, and so if you try to fool it, um, you can't because you have a limited vocabulary um, to attack. Uh, so that's one way to think about it. So hardware wallet would be the most secure mechanism for storing and controlling uh, cryptocurrency keys. Next up, 
I would say uh, in terms of security is a mobile smartphone, a, a properly maintained and up-to-date version of Android and iOS um, is more difficult to attack than, than almost any other device you own. So if you don't own a hardware wallet, the most secure device you do own is your Apple smartphone or your Android smartphone. The number of zero-day vulnerabilities or vulnerabilities that cannot be fixed simply by updating your version of Andro Android or iOS, the latest version, it is extremely limited. And these trade for tens of millions of dollars and are traded by state agencies and intelligence agencies and special hacking groups because they're so valuable because uh, being able to hack into a modern, properly maintained Android or Apple device is hard, and it should be hard. And it's even more hard over the internet. It's almost impossible to do it over the internet. It's much easier if you have the physical device. Um, so that's the second se most secure device you have. The third most secure device you have, and now we're getting into the not at all secure category, is your uh, desktop laptop operating system. So Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uh, any kind of desktop operating system. Uh, and Windows is the most insecure. Mac OS is a bit more secure. Linux is a bit more secure if you know what you're doing. But generally, all three of those far less secure than your smartphone. So your, your laptop is very insecure. And, and finally, the most insecure platform you have is a browser. A browser, if you think about it, is a mini operating system running JavaScript that is continuously exposed to all kinds of unfiltered um, things on the web. And so that's the least secure um, system you have in which to do cryptographic operations. So that's how you think of in terms of hierarchy of security. So if you don't have a hardware wallet, use a mobile smartphone. It's not as good, nowhere near, but it's better than um, uh, running a desktop or laptop operating system. Uh, and part of the reason for that is now let's go back to the analogy of how many words, vocabulary, or the language that that thing speaks. Hardware wallet very limited vocabulary. It only speaks a few words through a limited application programming interface or API that it uses to communicate about transactions and signatures, and that's it. That's all it knows how to do. It's not trying to do your calendar. It's not trying to do your email. It's not trying to browse you know, random websites. It's not um, connected to a thousand little apps that you downloaded of various um, authors and uh, places. It's not running games. It's doing none of that, very focused. Your mobile smartphone, closed ecosystem, specific app store, uh, very limited number of applications um, that are um, fairly purpose specific and the operating system is shielded from all of the applications that you're running. And uh, both iOS and Android have um, secure compartmentalized operating system um, so that you can run wallets in a somewhat secure environment. So much broader language. This thing is doing your calendar and your email and other things, but the operating system is pretty good at keeping them sandboxed. Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uh, now you go into the realm of being able to install any old executable that hasn't been uh, previously digitally signed and vetted, and, um, uh, and and that opens you to a broader attack surface. Uh, and this is also why I will keep saying this again and again, and you need to listen carefully and hear me when I say, do not do DIY security. There's all kinds of people who feel empowered and smart by customizing their own version of Linux or Tails or something like that uh, and using that in combination with an open source um, wallet like Sparrow or Electrum and they uh, try to make their own hardware wallet using that. This is a very, very bad idea. Um, 
I've been using Linux. Uh, I'm coming up on my 30th anniversary now for 30 years. I downloaded one of the very first versions in 1994, um, 1995. Uh, so in, in a year or two, I'm going to be 30 years of being a fairly sophisticated Linux user. Um, I've worked professionally as a sadman. I've worked professionally as a security engineer, hardening operating systems. I know what it takes to harden a Linux operating system and to make it robust. Um, it takes uh, tens of hours of work and a lot of work to keep it maintained in a hardened state. I would not do it for my own wallet. So um, while it can feel empowering, that's an illusion. In fact, what you're doing is you're greatly risking uh, exceeding your own technical capability without noticing and losing money. There's a very famous example of a Bitcoin core developer who designed their own system uh, using Linux uh, and uh, lost all of their money a couple years ago. Um, Daniel asks, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the major vulnerabilities, the ones we first th start the device, it requires us to tick the boxes, terms of agreements, share data policy, uh, share data with, you know, hundreds of companies. No, it's, it's not just that. I mean, that's a problem, yes, uh, in that modern operating systems in some cases are just giant data aggregators. But that's not the thing that's gonna get your password. No, it's the ability to run um, unverified code uh, that coexists in the same user space as your wallet and can therefore compromise. It's very easy to install a remote access Trojan toolkit um, by getting someone to click through on an email or run some code that they don't uh, realize is going to do something bad um, and take over that computer. It's very, very easy to do, even with sophisticated users. Um, So I would uh, recommend uh, that you understand the level of security risk you're facing in these kinds of circumstances. Don't try to improvise. Uh, the, the simple answer is for a hundred bucks, you can get a very decent uh, hardware wallet that is uh, 10,000 times more secure than your uh, desktop, a uh, thousand times more secure than your smartphone. Um, no comparison. And if you simply follow the instructions and back up your seed, um, you're not going to uh, lose your money. Okay, so let's go to some of the clarification questions, which I think are important. We've got a couple. Wendy um, asks, is the security of a web wallet versus a web wallet that connects to your hardware wallet the same? Or is the web wallet that connects to your hardware wallet more secure? Um, so these are co two completely different things. Your hardware wallet can operate through any software that's on your desktop or mobile smartphone. Um, it has to use some companion software to talk to the blockchain. And that companion software is going to run on the internet. It's going to run on an internet connected device, whether that's the software that comes with the manufacturer like Ledger Live or Trezor Suite, whether it's open source software like Sparrow or Electrum, whether it's a web uh, wallet like MetaMask. Because none of those things can talk to the hardware wallet except through this tiny, tiny opening that's the protocol that they speak, which is called the hardware wallet interface, the security depends entirely on the hardware wallet. Your job as a user is to understand that everything you see on your laptop screen, on your mobile smartphone screen, cannot be trusted. You see an address or you paste an address, you have to confirm that address by having it displayed on the screen of the hardware wallet because that's the only thing you can, tr you can uh, honestly trust. 
And you must never type your seed anywhere except the hardware wallet device. You never speak it, you never photograph it, you never write it down, you never uh, type it into any device that isn't your hardware wallet directly. You don't type it into your laptop to give it to your hardware wallet. Once you've done that, it's no longer cold storage. Um, one of the things to understand about the temperature of storage is that it's a one-way street. You can make cold storage hot. You cannot make hot storage cold. Once it's touched the internet, it's compromised. And you need to generate a new seed in a cold environment again um, so that you can trust it. So MetaMask connected to your ledger, the example that Wendy uses, is as secure as Ledger Live connected to your ledger. As long as you don't trust MetaMask or Ledger Live for anything other than uh, to talk to your hardware wallet, and then you look at the screen of the hardware wallet to confirm. So MetaMask can set up the transaction for you. Ledger Live can set up the transaction for you. Trezor Suite, Sparrow, Electrum, blah, 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 blah. All of these other wallets can set up the transaction for you. I want to pay X to this address. Great. You put all of that in to MetaMask or whatever your online wallet is, and then it sends that transaction to your hardware wallet. Let's say it's a ledger. And then you look on your hardware wallet and it says, do you want to send 0 0.01 Bitcoin to the address, blah, 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 blah. That's the bit that you have to read very carefully and say, do I in fact want to send this amount? And the hardware wallet is giving you a trusted verification of exactly how much you're sending including fees, right? Um, and are you sending it to the correct address? Read it off the screen of your hardware wallet, compare that to an address that you've received in a trusted way. Um, and then you can say yes and click accept on your hardware wallet. So, uh, Daniel asks, do you believe there will be a further upgrade for the seed? Instead of 12 words, uh, be given to keep 12 words, let's say a digital PNG file to keep, like an NFT alternative. Um, you'll need to input PNG files or images. Um, not Well, yes, there, there are already some ways of encoding the 12 words that, you, that could be in an image, and you could encode them in a QR code. Uh, the problem is, how do you produce that QR code on a device that is secure? Um, if you have to type your 12 words into a laptop, then you've got a problem. But primarily the, the limitation and the reason we use 12 words is because 12 words is the least common denominator between your ability to read, write, and transcribe something without making a mistake and the device's ability, the hardware wallet's ability, to display something on the screen that can be conveniently transcribed. Uh, so, um, and, and language is a perfect uh, common denominator that gives us something that any device can display on its screen unambiguously that you can then read off the screen and transcribe unambiguously without making a mistake onto some durable backup mechanism like steel. That's why we use 12 words. Um, I don't think we're gonna see upgrades because I don't see how you solve the fundamental problem uh, or the design criteria that you need in a more elegant way than a simple 12 words. Um, there's some other questions about self-custody solutions. I'm not going to analyze specific solutions because um, you should be thinking in broad principles instead of um, specific solutions. Do, you, do I recommend using desktop or mobile? Absolutely mobile, smartphone. Um, and so uh, use a smartphone. It is uh, 10 times more secure than your desktop. Do not use a desktop. You can use a desktop um, to connect to your hardware wallet. Yes, you can use a mobile to connect to your hardware wallet. That's fine. Then the keys are safely stored on the hardware wallet. 
But if you're storing the keys on the device itself, on a mobile, you have some degree of security. I would do that for up to, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars. Um, and I do do that. I use that for my own petty cash wallet. Uh, so if, you know, if I want to buy a beer from somewhere that takes Bitcoin, I'm going to use my mobile wallet. And that's a specific seed that is online and is meant to be used by, by my mobile smartphone that I use, in fact, on 25 different mobile wallet applications so I can test them out. And it contains a small amount, which I use to buy beer. And, you know, if I lose it, or if it gets stolen, if it gets hacked, if the wallet steals it from me, eh, okay, no big deal. I've lost a hundred bucks. Um, so uh, that's basically the idea. Uh, Luciana says, don't even memorize it. Yes, I would recommend against relying on memory. Also, the other reason you don't memorize it is because... Um, perhaps you might want your family to get access to it if something happens to you. I certainly do. So um, great solutions for that are uh, recording it on steel devices. Um, you can stamp it. There are kits out there you can get to uh, discuss it, um, to uh, record it on steel. Um, under desktop, I mean Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. Uh, there are a f there are some differences in security between those. You know, they're not equivalent. Uh, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux are not equivalent in terms of security, but they are in the same broad category compared to Android and iOS, which are a different category, much more secure. Um, and further compared to a hardware wallet that is a thousand times more secure. Uh, so I bundled together desktop because the difference between Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, uh, again, one of the problems with these operating systems, these desktop operating systems, is that unless you are an expert at operational security, um, you can get into very serious problems. Um, Anthony asks, uh, discuss security of watch-only wallets on mobile desktop. Again, we're getting a bit off track here, so I'm just going to briefly say, uh, yes, you can put a watch-only wallet on any anywhere you want. Uh, a watch-only wallet is just the public addresses. Uh, you can put that on uh, any device you want, as long as you don't care about your privacy. Uh, the question is, if someone compromises that and is able to see how much money you own, does that cause a problem for you? Uh, so then it becomes a question of privacy rather than the security of your funds. Uh, Toby says, do you recommend a passphrase for beginners? No, I do not. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, I recommend a passphrase as you get more sophisticated and if you accumulate very, very large amounts of money, and then you start using it gradually. If you do use a passphrase, and what we're talking about here is the optional passphrase you can add to the 12 words, I would use uh, a, a randomly generated uh, four to six English word uh, passphrase. If you don't know how to securely randomly generate a passphrase, uh, then it's uh, very dangerous. So um, if you just pick words uh, using your human mind or opening books, you're not put picking random words. Um, and in fact, it becomes much easier to, to crack. The passphrase will give you some additional security, but not a huge amount. Um, and Zoom user asks, what do you mean about recording it on steel? May you please explain? Let me just reach, because I have one over here. If I can do so without knocking everything over. Um, and I'm going to use this as uh, simply an example. And I'm not endorsing this particular um, uh, company. I'm using it as uh, an example. OK, so this is, this is a company called uh, CryptoSteel. Um, and they send you basically a capsule that you can fit little lettered tiles. And I don't know how much you'll be able to see, but you get 
a case like this. In this case, uh, in each of these holes, as you can see from the legend, has specific letters like uh, I, J, K, L, M, etc. Um, and so these things are tiny little um, steel tiles that have stamped on them a specific letter. Um, so you take out each one of these. There we go. I'll hold it up for you. That's the letter. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. That's the letter O. All right. On, on the back, it's in lower case. And that's stamped on a piece of steel. And you see that hole in the middle? I don't know if you can see it very well. To focus. Uh, that hole in the middle is where the rod uh, of the crypto steel capsule goes. So you basically thread these on and then uh, tie down the end. Um, and that way you can record uh, your seed. You only need the first four letters of each of the 12 words because the, the dictionary they're from is designed so that the first four letters are always unique. If you have the first four letters, you know which word it is. You don't need any more, for, any more letters. So you record the first four letters. So for 12 words, that's 48 letters. Uh, for 24, it's 96 letters. And you thread those letters and you put them on a steel capsule and you screw it together. Um, that's steel. I mean, it's very, very simple. Okay, that's a that's the expensive version that you have to buy in a kit. Um, but I've seen people do the same thing by getting a stamping kit, uh, which you can get from a hardware store uh, that gives you basically a set of letters and a hammer, and you hammer them onto a steel plate. Uh, just make sure it's um, stainless steel so that it doesn't um, corrode with rust. Um, and that thing is indestructible. So, um, furthermore, I often use, in addition to the steel, I use these um, plastic bags. You can get them from Amazon. Um, these are made by a company called, uh, I don't know if you can see that, MMF Industries. And so this is a bag. Uh, you put your seed inside the bag. Uh, and then once you seal it, this bag cannot be opened, not with heat, not with cold, not with acid, not with anything. It cannot be opened without breaking the bag. So uh, this is not tamper proof, it's tamper evident, meaning that if you tamper with it, you will leave evidence. It's impossible to open this bag non-destructively without showing that you tried to open the bag. So if you put your seed inside this bag, then by inspecting the bag itself, um, and they each have a serial number and you can sign them or whatever you can write on the outside, um, you know that nobody's been near your seed. And, and that's, you know, really, really simple physical security, lock and key. Um, these are called tamper evident bags. Often they're called cash bags. Um, ironically enough, they use them in churches um, to collect cash um, because it uh, turns out the people who take uh, the cash in church um, steal from God. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is quite ironic, um, but, but that's a very common thing in, in the United States. Won't they me melt with fire? Yes, absolutely. The plastic will melt, but that, that's why the thing inside is steel. That's why you record the seed on something that's in, in um, steel. Yeah, and you can use this when you want to send something by courier and make sure the courier doesn't see it. All right, let's get back to more questions. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, seed XOR. Is seed XOR, which is spelled S-E-E-D-X-O-R, a good strategy to split your seed phrase? And is this less secure than using Shamir? Um, seed XOR isn't a strategy for splitting your seed phrase. Um, it is less secure than Shamir because what it does is it creates a scheme where you need all of the pieces to recreate. Um, seed XOR is not a splitting system. It's a system that you can use to create effectively hidden seeds. 
by combining two or more um, obvious seeds. So you have your obvious seeds that you have money in, and then you uh, create a new seed, which is the exclusive or mix of the two seeds. And then you have a third seed that nobody knows exists that has additional money, perhaps. Um, so, so that's the purpose. Uh, plausible deniability or obfuscation of ownership is the purpose of seed XOR. It's not meant to give you uh, redundancy or splitting of seeds. In fact, if you create a seed XOR and you lose one of the component seeds, you're done. You've lost the money, completely lost the money. Uh, so whereas the other th thing you talked about, which was Shamir, Shamir is a way of uh, splitting a seed such that you only need K of N total. So for example, if you do a two of three, we call that a K of N scheme, a two of three Shamir scheme, then you can uh, essentially produce um, three shards and then any two of those shards can be used to recreate your seed. So it's a better mechanism for backup. Um, it's only supported uh, in a standards way by one company at the moment, Satoshi Labs, that makes the Trezor. And with a Trezor device, you can actually um, produce um, three shards for your seed and then store them. And each shard on its own is useless. Uh, and you need any two of those can be used to reconstruct uh, your seed inside uh, the Trezor device. Uh, Shamir's is named after Adi Shamir, who's uh, one of the cryptographers who created RSA, uh, the RSA cryptography system. And um, it's called Shamir's Secret Sharing Scheme. Uh, or SSSS, Shamir's Secret Sharing Scheme. And it's a mathematical concept that's fairly easy to understand, uh, which relies on uh, number theory uh, or geometry, depending on how you look at it. Um, so uh, you can think of it as, uh, let's say, um, think of the three shards, for example, as three points. And with any two points, you can uh, fit a line. So uh, if you remember your geography, any two points uh, define a line. So if you take three points on a line, uh, each of those points tells you nothing about the line. There are an infinite number of lines that can pass through a single point. So one point gives you nothing, two points give you the line, or three points give you the line. Uh, so you can recreate the line um, based on two of those points. So think of it, Shamir's secret sharing scheme is based on that principle where your seed is the line and you uh, store it as a collection of three uh, points of which any two are enough to recreate the line. And you can prove through mathematics that if you only have one, you have nothing uh, because an infinite number of lines can pass through that. Uh, two is enough to recreate it. Um, Mohammed asks, do you think all of these extra overheads associated with carrying wallets can act as a roadblock to mass usage of cryptocurrency? Absolutely. The vast majority of people will probably use custodial systems, but that's because the vast majority of people already use custodial systems. The question is, is someone willing to go through these overheads if they do not have access to a reliable banking system that does not continuously steal their money? Um, either through inflation or through direct confiscation. And you'll find um, that in many countries, the banking system cannot be trusted to simply hold your money. And so the alternative to that is either you have no way of um, storing money or you use this rather complicated cryptocurrency system, but then you have complete control. Having spoken to many Greeks and Argentinians and um, people from around the world who have that problem or have had that problem in the past, um, they will learn uh, these overheads. Uh, what you're really saying is that mass usage of cryptocurrency doesn't solve a problem for people um, because they already have banks and therefore they don't need all of these extra overheads. And you would be correct. 
if you have functioning banks that do not steal your money and your government uh, can be trusted uh, and your currency can be trusted, then you don't need cryptocurrency. Uh, the question is how many people actually have that? How many people have that in the world? And I, I think you'll find that those who don't have it will go through those overheads very, very happily um, to, for the first time in their life, get uh, actual control over their money. Uh, final, uh, I'll take this final follow-up here. Toby asks, if someone wants to storage a large amount with a seed, is it more important to tailor a solution or is there a best practice? No, it is more important that you do not tailor a solution um, because a tailored solution is one that no one else can decipher unless they know the specific pattern the tailor used. Um, so uh, think of this as uh, you're creating a treasure hunt but you're not just creating a treasure hunt for potential thieves. You're also creating a treasure hunt for uh, your family that might stand to inherit this value. So what, what happens if something happens to you uh, and you were the crypto expert who tailored this scheme? Um, so striking that balance is very difficult. Uh, striking the balance between making sure it won't be stolen from you and then making sure it can still be passed on to your family or used by you even if you forget something. Um, so I recommend that most people, uh, it is to their benefit to take the simplest, most common path possible. So 12 words recorded on steel and, uh, uh, and uh, stored in two locations that are both physically secured, um, but you can access those two locations is a, a great solution that gives you very robust security. You are unlikely to have your cryptocurrency stolen, but you are also unlikely to lose it because of a mistake you make. Um, going further than that uh, is something that I would only uh, suggest once you have sufficient experience um, and you want to continuously think how do I keep this as simple as possible um, and not try to do complicated things that nobody else has done before? All right. Oh, where did I where where did I put my questions? Uh, there they are. Um, Luciana asks, with colored coins or other methods used to add external data or assets to the Bitcoin blockchain, like adding the hash of a property deed to a transaction, is there a risk that a wallet might accidentally spend the associated UTXO when forming a regular transaction? If this happens, the asset could be destroyed causing participants in the contract to lose track of it and deem it invalid, making it impossible to transfer it in the future. Is this how Bitcoin is expropriated as a notary office and UTXO management must be done with careful manual oversight? If this question sounds confusing, it's because I am very confused. I'll make it shorter. What is the mechanism to map a UTXO to a physical asset and what are the requirements for proper management and transfer of this asset? Luciana, actually, you, you nailed it. Um, this is, in fact, uh, exactly what is happening with all of the various forms of colored coins. So you may hear this expression, colored coin, um, but you may also hear all of these layer two protocols, um, RSK and stacks and blocks and uh, block the stacks and uh, ordinals and various other names that are given to various things that allow you to issue tokens or record tokens or deeds or NFTs onto Bitcoin. To simplify all of these and to understand them, the fundamental operating mechanism is the same. The fundamental operating mechanism is to color a specific coin. Uh, that means to store metadata alongside a specific UTXO um, of whatever value, usually a very small value, um, so that 
the UTXO value itself is irrelevant to the um, discussion of the thing that is carried on top of the UTXO. And so I have a, an analogy that I use um, that might clarify this. Let's say um, you have a uh, 10 euro uh, banknote or $1 banknote. So you have paper money, right? Um, and the paper money says on it 10 euros and that's worth 10 euros or it says $1 and it's worth $1. Now um, you take that $1 and you stamp on it something else. So using a rubber stamp, you stamp onto the dollar and it says this dollar represents one share uh, of, uh, let's pick a stock, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, so I don't know what the value of Berkshire Hathaway is right now, um, but last time I checked, it was $200,000 per share, right? Uh, so it's, it's, I picked that one just because it's, it has a very large value per share. So um, let's say that that stamp is stamped on the dollar and says, this is now a share of Berkshire Hathaway and it's signed by the secretary of uh, the Berkshire Hathaway uh, group. And so it's a valid stock certificate. And mm -hmm. you could use that dollar bill or 10 euro bill if you want. Um, and it would be accepted by the Berkshire Hathaway company or the stock market or wherever as a share certificate that entitles you to one share. Well, how much value does that thing have? Well, $200,000, let's say. So, but, but the dollar bill still has a dollar value, right? Um, the stamp on it means that it now has a $200,000 value as a share certificate, but it still has a $1 value as a US Federal Reserve dollar bill. Now, what happens if you go to the corner shop and you buy a pack of gum, which you obviously can't buy for a dollar because of inflation, but let's assume you could. You buy a pack of gum for a dollar, you give them and you accidentally pull out of your wallet, because you have it in the same wallet as all your other dollar bills, you pull out your Berkshire Hathaway stamped bill and you give it to them and they give you some gum. Well, now you've made a very bad mistake. Um, there's two possibilities here. Uh, one possibility uh, is that the store owner doesn't know that this is worth anything else. So they continue treating it as a $1 bill. But in any case, all you got for it was a pack of gum and you've basically lost uh, something of $200,000 in value. Uh, so this is how colored coins work. If you have a UTXO that's worth one Satoshi, but the NFT that's encoded on it is worth a million bucks and you spend that in order to pay a transaction fee, that was one Satoshi, well, you just lost the value of the NFT because the recipient um, will not recognize what that is. So your wallet needs to make sure that it doesn't mix the stuff that is inscribed with special meaning and treat it as its face value instead of its special inscribed value. So treat it not as a dollar bill, but treat it as a, a share of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you need a smart wallet to do that, a wallet that knows about the inscription that's on there. And if you put the same keys in a wallet that doesn't know about the inscriptions that you've added on and you use that wallet, you run the risk of spending the dollar bill to buy uh, something inconsequential and destroying it in the process. Especially in the case of Bitcoin where um, the the NFT is literally inscribed on the UTXO rather than um, uh, a record of the public address being recorded in a smart contract as happens in Ethereum, you can actually destroy the value. You can actually effectively destroy that share, share certificate um, when you spend it because that UTXO will get spent and then it won't get inscribed on whatever output you created. So you can, your wallet can accidentally destroy um, that inscription. And not only do you use it, you lose it. Everybody loses it. It's like the shopkeeper can't take it and use it as a Berkshire Hathaway stock either. Um, 
And that's one of the reasons why um, NFTs and tokens on uh, smart contract platforms like uh, Ethereum are superior to the ones that are attached to Bitcoin. It's because of that rich functionality that comes from the ability to have executable smart contracts that are part of the consensus rules. Um, every time we do this, or in fact, every time I do any kind of um, discussion about uh, smart contracts, or in fact, any discussion about Bitcoin, um, people will ask me, well, why can't we do, okay, uh, why can't we do smart contracts on uh, Bitcoin? And the answer is always the same. It has to do with um, the fact that the smart contract itself is not part of the consensus rules uh, and that there are better platforms for doing that. So um, it's actually not an efficient platform to do. Najam asks a follow-up, how is an NFT actually inscribed on the UTXO? Is it encoded or visible to everyone? Are there any online resources to read more on how this is done? It depends on the platform. Um, the canonical way of doing it is to use a, a Bitcoin script um, function that was added in, I believe, 2015 uh, uh, or so, or 2016, called op return, which allows you to encode 80 bytes of data inside an output. So you can attach 80 bytes to a UTXO. And in those 80 bytes, you can put... Um, you can put a hash. You can put a small hash that represents some NFT or token. Um, and how you encode the token into those 80 bytes? Well, that that's a protocol that you have to develop. And different different uh, platforms for NFTs or color coins have different protocols for doing it. Um, and... Angeliki says there is a new white paper for doing smart contracts on BTC. Um, I bet there is. There is a new white paper for doing smart contracts on BTC on average every Tuesday. Um, but there has been a new white paper for doing smart contracts on BTC uh, ever since uh, 2013 that I remember uh, with uh, the Omni protocol one of the first ones that I saw, which is in fact the systems that Vitalik tried to use to build Ethereum and then figured out why this was a bad idea. Um, people have been trying to um, make Bitcoin be a jack of all trades um, from the beginning almost. Uh, and all of those efforts um, have failed the most important test, which is the market test. Uh, and for people who are so kind of enamored almost to a level of religious doctrine with the free market and free market ideals, you would think that if the free market has repeatedly told you that your solution is inferior uh, to the one offered by something else, in this case, Ethereum, you'd get the message and say, well, the free market has spoken. Uh, and the free market has spoken again and again and again to the point where the free market is beginning to lose its voice uh, from all of the screaming of why are you doing this on Bitcoin? There are better platforms out there. Um, but apparently uh, that's not the answer that people wanted from the free market. Um, let's uh, go with a couple more questions there. Uh, Naj asks, I'm recently hearing about Bitcoin ordinals and how it's being used to inscribe data in Satoshis. I don't quite understand how it is achieved technically. Could you please explain as to what it means and why it is being used now as a new functionality? So you know how I said um, that uh, in most cases, the UTXO is inscribed using uh, op return or some similar functionality. Sometimes it's used... Um, with a kind of sideways mechanism in the past, people use things like public keys to encode it or various forms of uh, scripts that weren't actually scripts. And these are more wasteful than op return. Well, ordinals decided to go with the absolutely most wasteful possible mechanism, which is to encode the actual asset, not its hash, but the actual asset being the JPEG or the PNG or the whatever data. 
um, directly onto the Bitcoin blockchain by sticking it where a signature would normally go. So the way that ordinals works is it uses, or some would say abuses, the uh, segregated witness uh, capability within Bitcoin to cram up to three megabytes of data in to every one megabyte Bitcoin block, making them four megabytes big, and use the space that um, was meant for signatures um, to encode actual JPEGs, to put them right in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and so ordinals is the exception. It's uh, using the least efficient way to do it. And the reason for that is because the theory is that that benefits most from immutability and censorship resistance. Um, unfortunately, uh, I can think of very few things that uh, you would need encoded in such a way that can't uh, just as easily be encoded with IPFS. And many of those things are things that broadly as a society we consider bad. Um, so that's not a very good use case in my opinion. All right, a couple of uh, more questions from... Naj Mudin, or, uh, I hope I can call you Naj. Um, could you please explain Schnorr signatures and how they are better than ECDSA signatures previously used in Bitcoin? Um, mathematically, no, I can't. Um, Schnorr signatures are a different uh, mechanism for doing signatures on the elliptic curve than the elliptic curve digital signature alg algorithm or ECDSA. Uh, the mathematics um, make my head hurt, but I understand them if I stare at them long enough. The bottom line is a more practical understanding. So uh, from a practical perspective, there are uh, there are three distinct advantages to Schnorr signatures. Schnorr signatures are more efficient uh, in uh, their calculation and also in their encoding. So they can be encoded in less space. Um, and uh, Schnorr signatures also have a number of properties that ECDSA signatures do not have, meaning that we can do some special arithmetic with them that is really useful, uh, things like threshold signatures. And what this means is that you can implement effectively a K of N scheme with Schnorr signatures um, you can also implement uh, addition and multiplication operations on them so that the sum of signatures is the same as the signature produced by the sum of private keys um, and the sum of public keys. So uh, that transitive function is very, very useful for various types of tricks that you might want to do with Schnorr signatures that allow you to do uh, things like multi-party computation, um, uh, bare multi-sig, threshold signatures, et cetera. So uh, Schnorr, more efficient, uh, can do more arithmetic tricks with them. So then why didn't we use Schnorr from the beginning? And the answer is really simple. Schnorr was under patent uh, when uh, Satoshi uh, created uh, Bitcoin and ECDSA was not. Uh, so, in fact, there was a discussion at the time of why not use Schnorr, and the idea of using something that was under patent and could have licensing implications in the open source community was something that Satoshi wanted to avoid. Schnorr fell out of patent, um, I believe, in 2020, and at that point, uh, anyone could use it without a license, and then it was implemented in Bitcoin because it's actually better. Uh, so that's Schnorr. The second question, which is a follow-up to that from Naj, is can you briefly explain what features were added to Bitcoin in the Taproot upgrade? So the Taproot upgrade uh, was actually a package of three different sets of features, which are documented uh, in three different BIPs. Uh, and if I remember off the top of my head, 340, 341, uh, maybe 342, I'm not sure. So those are. Uh, Schnorr signatures. So that's the first part of the upgrade. Uh, the second one was a uh, was Taproot, 
um, which is basically a uh, form of, well, let me say no, uh, Schnorr signatures, revising it. The second one is uh, syntax trees, uh, Merkleized abstract syntax trees, a specific form of them. So what this allows you to do is instead of having a script that is written as a single line, uh, you can have a script that is created as a syntax tree um, where you can have different clauses on different branches of the tree. So rather than saying you can spend this money if uh, A plus B plus C plus D equals three or whatever you write in the script language, you can instead create a tree. You say, well, here's one way you can spend this money. Here's another way you can spend this money. Here's another way you can spend this money. And here's another way you can spend this money. And that uses Merkle trees where all of the ways that you can spend the money are encoded as uh, simply the root hash of the Merkle tree of all of the scripts. So each branch uh, leads to a script and then you can choose which of the branches you want to use to spend the money. And this gives you a much more flexible scripting language that also increases privacy. It allows you to do a number of very efficient operations. The third feature uh, that was introduced with Tappert is um, on the tree, there's a special branch, let's call it the thumb. Uh, it's called the graft root. Um, and this is um, basically the ability to have one way of spending the money that is when everyone agrees and they put all of their signatures together to produce like a super signature. And this relies on Schnorr. You remember when I said that the sum of signatures is the same as the signature of the sum of private keys? Um, so when you sum all of the signatures together and then um, you apply a single signature, it looks like one person spending with one wallet, but in fact, it could be a complex multi-sig arrangement and it kind of disguises it in such a way that you only see one signature applied on one public key and uh, you think, oh, okay, this is a regular wallet. Behind the scenes, what you don't realize is that this is a multi-party computation that happened between, let's say, the two participants of a lightning channel. Um, and you don't know that that's what it was. Or it's a multi-party computation that involved uh, several people involved in a multi-sig. So that's the three components of Taproot. I hope that explained it enough, the three features of tap, Taproot. And we're almost done. Um, okay. Eloik asks, uh, if Binance Smart Chain has issues with its native coin, BNB, will it affect other coins running on the same network? For example, SLP or Shiba or other BEP20 coins? Um, Yes, and I will also answer that in the more general. If there is a problem with Ether, the native coin of Ethereum, that affects all of the smart contracts, ERC tokens, NFTs, etc., running on top of Ether, uh, running on top of Ethereum. Um, and in the same way, if there's a problem with Binance uh, coin, BNB, that affects everything else that's running on the chain because the native token, as it's called, um, which is the, run, the one that runs directly on the blockchain, determines uh, things like fees, um, which also act as an anti-spam measure. Uh, it determines the reward for the consensus mechanism, be it proof of stake or proof of work, et cetera, et cetera. So the actual running, it's the gas that makes the thing run. Um, and... So think about this as you've got the main blockchain, it's the engine, and you've got the gas that it runs on, which is ether, let's call it diesel, that is the fuel that runs the engine. And then you've connected to this vehicle a bunch of trailers, and you've put things on the roof, and you've got things hanging off the doors, etc. Well, if you run out of gas or the engine fails, 
all of the trailers connected to that vehicle, all of the things on the roof and everything hanging off the doors also stops working, right? So if there's a problem with the native stable coin, that problem affects uh, everything else. Uh, if it's a problem with the native coin and the native stable coin. Um, well, uh, again, um, Daniel asks as a follow up, for example, BUSD. Uh, well, the native stable coin effectively has two sets of problems. One set of problems is what if the USD is no longer there or no longer accessible? Um, and this is the third party risk or counterparty risk problem of stable coins that have um, fiat reserves. If the bank accounts are frozen, the, the token is worthless. Um, if the bank accounts are embezzled, the token is worthless, see what happened to FTX, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but native stable coins that have reserves have another problem, which is if the chain that the native stable coin is running on gets compromised or breaks down or stops operating or stops processing transactions, then Again, the token is worthless now for a different reason, not because its reserves are worthless. The reserves may still be sitting there, but because you can't actually uh, have liquidity and velocity of the, of the stable coin. So stable coins that have uh, fiat reserves manage to combine the problems of a cryptocurrency with the problems of fiat. And they also give you the benefits of cryptocurrency with the perceived benefits of uh, fiat too. So you have to th consider both of those together. Um, whereas stable coins that don't have fiat reserves may have chain risks and smart contract risks, but they don't have counterparty reserve risks. That would be an example of DAI um, in the Ethereum space, a decentralized stable coin, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you have to think about kind of systemic risks that come from different angles. Rita asks, is there a standard way to determine the fee amount I need to add to my transaction? I don't want it to be too low, so it will be stuck in the mempool or to pay too high. Um, yes, Rita. Uh, and the way you have to think about it is backwards. The question is not what fee do you choose when you first broadcast the transaction, because your chances of getting that right, um, it's more difficult to get that right. Uh, so what happens is if you only have one chance to make that decision to decide how much fee you're going to put, then the result is that most people end up overpaying because they want to make sure the transaction goes through. So they end up bidding higher and higher and outbidding each other. They get into a bidding war in order to get through. Um, once you have the ability to change the fee, then you can follow the opposite strategy. So, for example, in Bitcoin, we have mechanisms for changing the fee, such as replace by fee, RBF, and a child pays for parents, CPFP. And if your wallet supports this, then you know that the first fee you set isn't the end of the story and doesn't have to be right, because you can always change the fee and try again. And that gives you a great advantage, because then you can go in with a lowball cheap fee uh, on the hope that you hit the blockchain at a time when it's not super congested, your transaction gets through, you saved a lot of money. But if your transaction gets stuck, you can then bump it a bit, see how that goes, and then bump it again, and maybe bump it again. And you can do this even between blocks as many times as you want. Um, so that gives you a lot more flexibility. So the trick isn't to guess the right fee the first time. The trick is to use a wallet that allows you to try again if you got it wrong the first time. Um, and I think those are the two relevant questions for this week. That's the last relevant question. And uh, I think we are right on time and wrapped up. So uh, thank you so much for coming to session four. I'll see you next week.
Um, great job with the questions this week. Uh, remember, ask in the forum during the week. Don't wait and bring your questions to the chat because I may not be able to answer them and I won't be going off topic to answer the chat. So thank you so much for attending. I'm Andreas M. Antonopoulos. I've been your teacher for this session four of the Massive Open Online course for the master's degree and digital currencies by the University of Nicosia. See you next week. Have a great one. Bye-bye.